right, and welcome to episode number, this is going to be episode number 14 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. So how are you doing today, Shane? I'm not too bad. How about you, Chris? I'm doing pretty good. I thought, uh, well, this one will talk about some recent observations and our, our poor weather conditions. But just as we were chatting here before um, we started recording, and congratulations for now up to probably by the point that this goes live, uh, over 400 downloads for just hovering below 400 downloads uh, right now. So thanks so much to everybody who's, who's listening. I mean, that's uh, really nice just, just to see those numbers going up. Yeah, yeah, it's really encouraging. Yeah, so I did listen to a couple of the podcasts last week, and I thought they sounded great. I actually thought, Shane, I thought you sounded really, really good, but um, I was dropping out here and there, so I actually have invested some money into our podcasting fray now. I had I had a, a pretty good microphone before, but I was just using one of those tabletop stands, so I've uh, I've put it on a bit of a boom arm here, so um, we'll see we'll see how that goes. So I'm hopeful that that this will uh, give some better sound quality. I, I don't want to wear a headset. I, I, uh, I do like to move around quite a bit when we're chatting. Um, so anyway, hopefully this, hopefully this sounds a little bit better for people out there. So thanks everybody for their, uh, for their patience. And that will strive to make improvements as, uh, as we go forward. O- onward and upward. As they onward say. and upward. Yeah. So excellent. So how was your week, Shane? What have you been up to? Oh, uh, well, um, let me just think here. The week was pretty busy with work. Uh, as, uh, you know, as amateur astronomers, we, we have normal day jobs and uh, that got the better of me. But I did get out one night for observing just in the backyard and it was a short session. And my goal was to use the new 76 millimeter Takahashi to see if I could split some double stars and uh just get a feel for some of its capability in that regard cool yeah and how did you you make out oh um well there was a there's one in virgo that i targeted it's uh i guess depending what catalog you look at um in the sao catalog it's one five seven eight six zero and it's a seventh magnitude double. Um, its companion, though, is magnitude 11.35. So the companion is fairly dim, and um, the separation between the two is 3.6 arc seconds. So they're not super close, but they're not, you know, it's not a wide gap either. So I thought, uh, I thought it would be an interesting, you know, first attempt, I guess, at a double star. Both of them are like white stars. Uh, Some stars do show color. And when you're looking at a double star system, when there are contrasting colors, um, you know, they're quite pretty and and it becomes quite noticeable. Um, But anyway, it, uh, it, you know, split them exceptionally well. Um, The power I was using, let me just do the calculation real quick. It was a 12 and a half millimeter eyepiece. So the focal length of 969, divided by 12.5. So 77 and a half times power, um, split it quite well without any issues. Um, and it's funny, you know, sometimes with double star observing, um, you know, I use power to uh, record the observation or, or to get the actual split between the two stars. And then when I dial back the power, uh, I'm able to see it even with, you know, a lower powered eyepiece. And that was the case with this one. Whereas when I initially found it, I had a 24 millimeter eyepiece in there. Um, You know, so that would be like 35 times. And I didn't notice the companion star until I put more magnification on it. But then when I, again, reduced the magnification, it became very apparent even at low magnification. Huh. Interesting. I think, I think I noticed that last year, like we were down in grasslands, if you recall, uh, I had a, had a list of some things we were looking at and there were some double stars in there. And to be honest, I haven't really looked at, uh, at that many double stars, but yeah, I think I noticed that same, same sort of phenomena as well. And, you know, the really neat thing about these, these uh, quality refractors is that, you know, when you are splitting doubles like that, um, those stars look like tiny little balls, you know, next to each other. <laughs> like it's, it's pretty remarkable how tight a star image can look when you're really just just analyzing what a star image looks like. Eh? So were these colorful doubles or did you notice anything interesting or unusual about them? No, no, uh, they're both white. 
Um, what I was looking for was uh, two, like uh, a double star system that had, uh, you know, fairly wide differing magnitudes. You know, a, a 7.28 magnitude is, you know, not a bright star, but it's not, uh, not a dim star by any stretch. But when it's paired with, you know, something in that 11 magnitude range or, or dimmer, uh, you know, that starts to amp up the, I don't know if you call it the difficulty, but it, you know, it's a little harder to sometimes detect those. So um, that's why I picked this one. Yeah. Um, but other than that, really no, no special aspects of this. Um, it's about 800 light years away from our solar system. Uh, the main star, so the one that's 7.28 magnitude to us is um, it's, it's 69 times brighter than our sun actually. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting, but huh. Okay. So um, let's see. So is this an optical double set or you said uh, you said it was a system. So they're, I'm, I'm assuming they're in orbit around each other. And do you know the period of that uh, orbit? Um, I'm just looking for it here. Cause I know like the ones we were looking at last year, like they were ones uh, that, uh, you know, uh, double star and variable star observer Rakuziak we observe, but sometimes uh, looks at and, he uh he knew like all like the orbits and like the duration yeah, and everything yeah. so i'm really i'm really not uh, much of a double star observer though i did really enjoy that last year like i hadn't really looked at double stars very much um typically i just do it a couple times a year when i'm writing a, a certain articles and then uh you know i did really enjoy did really enjoy those sessions so yeah, yeah. I'm not sure of the, the orbital period between these two, unfortunately. I'll have to do some research. Yeah, on. yeah, do some research, yeah. So uh, how many doubles did you look at that night? Just that one. I spent a lot of time with it, just uh, di differing magnitudes, mm -hmm. um, or sorry, different differing magnifications. Yeah. And I, I went extreme on it, but I wasn't, I, I was on my tracking mount, and this is going to sound ridiculous, I was using a tracking mount, but I didn't turn it on. So the tracking wasn't, <laughs> wasn't actually providing any assistance. Nice. And uh, I tried uh, about 285 times magnification. Wow. That's a lot and of magnification. It is. Three inch. It, yeah. Yeah. It was a lot. And um, it was just a pain because the star flew through the field of view quite quickly. Yeah. What night was that that you were out? Uh, gee, was that Tuesday night? Yeah, it was. I was. I must not have been out that night. Yeah, there was a night I didn't go out. Yeah, and it was. It was clear, or or it was clearing, and then getting occupied with something else or whatever. Yeah, there was one night I had to work. There was like uh, I do some off-hour support work, and uh, and I end up uh, doing something for about an hour or so. I think that, I think it was that night. It must have been. So yeah, the other nights were they were stinkers. Boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, hasn't, it hasn't been a good week. And, you know, you yeah. and I were both hoping to get outside of our city to a darker sky last night. And uh, gee, the wind and the, you know, the seeing just, it really wasn't a good night. And it wasn't worth our time, I don't think, to drive out there. Yeah, yeah, our luck seems to have shifted a little bit. My rings and things are still stuck in Winnipeg. So I had finally tracked down a set of rings in Germany last week. I was going to get them I was going to get a pair made in Germany because because you can get a pair of wooden rings made up these days. You cannot get a pair of aluminum rings made up because all the uh, aluminum die blocks, uh, apparently, and this is what I was told by a manufacturer, is that um, they were having trouble sourcing the, just the raw materials to actually build out of, um, at least in their area. And they were in Italy. So, you know, there's there's been a lot of uh, coronavirus challenges over there. So I'm not sure if they're they're using all the aluminum for, for building uh, ventilators or what it is. And that's, that's great. You know, my, this is not, not like a big problem for me. I can just uh, wait it out with, uh, with another set of rings, but uh, certainly uh, manufacturers are being, being impacted in all sorts of different ways uh, by the current state of things. But I was able to track down a pair in Germany from telescope service and definitely a plug for telescope service because I placed that order at about 8:30 AM. And uh, they had them in the mail at 10.22 a.m. my time. And that's, uh, I think, like 4 or 5.22 p.m. Uh, Germany time. And they landed, I had a notification the next morning 
that they would be out for delivery the following day. So that's a, that would be a 48 hour turnaround. And they would have been, um, but they landed in Minnesota from Germany. I'm not sure how that even happens. I guess there must be direct flights from Germany to Minnesota still these days. And uh, they drove them up to Winnipeg and we're, we're kind of about uh, five or six hours of driving from Winnipeg. And then, uh, and then unfortunately, uh, just because of when they came through customs, I missed like this very narrow window for them to get on one of the few planes that, that come across from Winnipeg to Regina these days. So they're just, they, they did eventually, well, they cleared customs and I paid the brokerage. Um, but unfortunately they are, they are sitting on the tarmac uh, waiting to be loaded uh, into uh, a plane probably Tuesday or Wednesday. So it could be a few more days getting them, unfortunately. So. Well, that's still pretty incredible shipping time. Wow. Yeah. Telescope service. Um, I've ordered from them before. Like I am a customer. Um, other than that, I have no affiliation. And I think telescope service is, I mean, they carry some really interesting stuff. That's where I bought that fuel flattener for the 80. Mm, yeah. Which, uh, which I'm going to call them my favor and see if you can kind of fix up for me and I can, I can pass along the field flattener as well. Um, you can play with that. And, uh, and some other stuff they carry just uh, some sort of oddball uh, products like that. So, uh, but yeah, they've, they were really good. Yeah. They, you know, got things uh, in the mail and um, yeah, there's some other stuff from, from Italy that I ordered as well. And uh, they were able to uh, get that in and get, get that out as part of that package too. So I was really surprised at that because I kind of inquired about that a couple of weeks ago and it was a five day wait and then it was a zero day wait eventually too. So yeah, so good stuff. So hopefully those will arrive with some clear weather here in coming weeks. So that's exciting. Yeah, yeah. And right now, moon the moon is favorable for dark sky observing because I don't think the moon is rising until like three or four in the morning. Or yeah, and yeah, uh, the moon starting. is our you know it's a blessing and a curse. It's it's fun <laughs> to look at with a lot of detail, but when it's in the sky and it's visible, it really it it brightens the sky so much that it it makes uh, the dark skies kind of pointless like there's no sense leaving the city because the moon just washes out the sky so when it's rising this late it's nice to take advantage of of it and you know get outside of the city and do some good dark sky observing yeah and speaking of the moon though i did get out um for an early morning session i think it was the morning of the 12th and i talked about this in the uh sort of the lead up to the month in, in the, what to observe in May. And I said that I was going to go out on the, on the morning of the 12th. And I did um, get up and go out to see the, uh, the Jupiter, Saturn and moon um, aggregation. I didn't want to call it a conjunction because I don't think they were in the correct alignment of right ascension or whatever it is. Um, maybe I'll call that an, an applause um, or an pulse. And then uh, I used my seven by 35. So I was going to try it in my, in my little uh, 60 millimeter, but you have the, uh, you still have the bracket for that, which was fine because um, with my binoculars, I have about two more degrees field of view and it barely fit in those. So I don't think it would have fit in the telescope anyway. Um, wow. You, you so really wide. Sorry, nine or 10 degrees then? Nine degrees. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you really needed a nine degree field of view, but I mean, they did fit in my seven by 35s, uh, but just barely. So that was kind of cool. That was kind of cool. And they, you know, on the edge of the field like that, definitely things are, things are not uh, that crisp. I'm just using a, a fairly low end seven by 35, but, uh, but they fit. Uh, it was kind of neat. And then uh, on a couple nights, I was able to get out and do some more testing with the uh, new uh, refractor that I had, which is the TAC 100 DC. And uh, I believe, and I sent you some photos <laughs> yes. that night that I was at observing. The reason why I was sending you photos of my telescope and not looking through it was it was clear, but that was one of the worst nights of seeing conditions that I've ever experienced. It was really? horrendous. So the stars are actually pulsing and they kind of look like, I don't know if you've ever seen like a caricature of the sun and it has like all those spikies around the edge. Yep. Well, I mean, the sky was just every star that you, you try to look at was kind of doing that and pulsing. I mean, I could get tight star images and then they would just kind of go in and out of focus. And it was, uh, that night was, was really, really bad. Um, it wouldn't even hold, I was using 105 power and I had to drop to about 75 power because the, the sky just, just wouldn't hold it. But, uh, but my wife and I, we had a nice long look at, uh, at Venus as it boiled away up there and, and shimmered and shook. Um, 
and I was able to fortunately use those uh, that tack clamshell um, that Mike had loaned me. So I finally got the got the screws in um, that I'd ordered and uh, and get that kind of bolted uh, bolted together through my uh, through my dovetail. But yeah, still even once I got that working, still not a fan. And like I talked to Mike again, he's like. He just he just could never find the love for the tack clamshells either. So I think the smaller one is better. Like that one you bought, so you're getting the tack clamshell for yours, but I think you end up buying the little clamshell like I have loaned you. Yeah. 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 So I think I think that one's good because I haven't been as frustrated with that, other than it's kind of heavy for a single ring. Um, I think that that one hasn't frustrated me as much. But like this one, it's kind of like hinged and the hinge kind of goes out of like a kind of like it's not symmetrical, like it doesn't have to be symmetrical. So it kind of can droop and swoop. And um, when I when I put the, uh, oh, it's like the locking bolt down. It, it, yeah, like there's like a little washer and the washer didn't seat the first time. I'm like, is that gonna slip out? Like, it just seems sketchy. Like, and so then I redid it with the washer and it definitely seemed uh, tighter, but I mean, you can miss a washer. Um, you know, as far as uh, like bolting those clamps down in the dark. So oh, yeah. Yeah. when you have two, when you have two rings, it's not a big deal. Chances are if one doesn't, you know, uh, totally uh, grab purchase, the other one will. So it's fine. But when you only have one, if you're, you know, really new expensive telescope mounted in it, you're kind of like, uh, yeah, I'm just going to redo that. And it's just kind of annoying to have to do that. Um, I do like the fact that I can just kind of back it off and then slide the telescope up and down. Uh, inside the clamshell um, and I don't mind the look although it's it's big like it's a big piece of gear and it's fairly heavy like considering this is just attaching the telescope to the mount um, it's it's a big piece of gear and uh, it's kind of clunky looking so it's like sitting on our uh, our kitchen table just because I kind of have some of my stuff out as I'm getting things working and playing with it and it's yeah it's kind of big and not that attractive and not that that matters, but the performance on it as well uh, isn't really what I'm looking for. So I'm, I'm excited to get like regular tube rings. I've always used regular tube rings, except for the other clamshell uh, that I bought. And I, you know, I think probably in retrospect, what I ought to have done is I probably should have just bought a set of rings for my 60 and just given you that tag clamshell. Cause yeah, yeah. I, I think we're going to go with rings on that eventually anyway. So. Yeah. Hey, just getting back to your binocular observation, um, what detail were you able to see on Saturn and Jupiter through seven by 35s? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> were, were you able to at least discern Saturn as more ovalish because of the rings? Yeah. So, yeah, this is sort of kind of something I've been looking at today. And that's that. So these binoculars, these are a seven by 35, which I like. I like that power and size. And they're made by Nikon. They're an action extreme and uh, they're ruggedized and they have really good eye relief. And I'm somebody who likes, who not likes, but I have to wear glasses when I do astronomy. Um, and they're really good for that. But they've traveled a lot. And I think that they're starting to show um, that. And so I, I think they're either a little bit out of alignment or, or something is squeezing the optics because they almost have... Um, like a bit of, not a bit, but a fair amount of astigmatism to see it at seven power um, uh, going on. Definitely something is is up with those uh, binoculars. Uh, but, you know, I've had them for like 10 years or so, and they've traveled around the earth 10 times. <laughs> so, you know, those things, I like just sort of as, as the crow flies kind of thing, because uh, I haven't traveled around the earth, but um, you know, they've been to Hawaii, they've been to Florida, they've been back to my folks place several times. Um, like I, I've taken them, I take them everywhere. Every time I get on a plane, that's what I take. Um, most of the time now I also take my, my telescope with me too. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of thinking I should either send them back to, to Nikon and see if they can, they can take a look at them. I know there's other companies that, that will take a look at, uh, binoculars, or maybe I should just uh, see what else is available. So I've been kind of, kind of looking around at that. So this is just, uh, maybe just for information purposes, kind of getting caught in a funny time where we're doing this podcast, because I often go for years without buying any astronomical equipment at all whatsoever. 
And uh, the last time I bought anything was I bought a telescope for $80 to modify last September and I bought a new eyepiece, which was the first eyepiece I had bought in eight years or something like that. So um, it seems kind of weird. Like it seems like I'm always talking about buying gear. It's just the cycle I'm in right now. Gear that I bought that wasn't really high end and I do so much observing, I think it's starting to kind of wear out a bit. So these binoculars are like $120 binocular, which is great. And if you're not traveling with them and throwing them in suit cases and throwing them in carry-on bags uh, and, you know, just even just throwing them in the back of the car or taking them to class and handing them around and letting, you know, 80 or 90 or 120 new people kind of handle them a year. Um, you know, if you're not doing all that, probably you could get the rest of your life out of, out of a pair of Nikon Action Extremes. But um, these ones definitely, definitely have had, uh, had a more uh, sociable and robust and, and uh, maybe challenging existence than, than the average binocular. And it's only now, you know, like I said, maybe eight or 10 years that, that they're starting to show that. So, so like I'm not able to really get the moons of Jupiter, which I think I should be able to do through a 70 by 35. So, yeah. But you've got some nice binoculars, Shane. You're, you're running some uh, 12 by 36 Canons, I think. Uh, yeah, Canon uh, image stabilized binoculars. Um, I bought these, oh gee, uh, probably at least 10 years ago. Um, so they have a little button on the top that you press and then it engages some electronics inside the binocular that compensates for any vibration in your hand. Because like trying to handhold a binocular that has 12 times magnification, um, you know, at least for me, that would be impossible because the vibration just you, you wouldn't be able to steady it enough to have a, any kind of, you know, usable observation. Um, but when you press that image stabilizing button, it is incredible. It's like you've just placed the binoculars on a tripod, except, you know, you're still hand holding them. Um, so yeah, I love them. And uh, they're light enough that I can, I can use them all night without, you know, feeling any kind of fatigue and small enough that I can take on various trips and, you know, I've used them whale watching and things like that. Um, they go with me wherever I go, similar to your 7x35s. Yeah. Um, I just love them. They're fantastic. And they provide about a five degree field of view. So not, not super wide, but, uh, you know, 12 times is, is phenomenal. The, maybe the one downside is 36 millimeters is a little light for, you know, nighttime observing. But I kind of, you know, I don't. I don't really miss aperture uh, when I'm looking through those. I, I love them. Yeah. And like, I agree, like these smaller binoculars, I think it's, it's where it's at because you can hold them for so long. Like, um, you know, one of our observing buddies has the, has the 15 by 50, 15 by fifties, which are awesome. Like they're an amazing binocular, but um, kind of to even get the most out of those, it, it works really well to kind of have them mounted up uh, one way or another. And uh, they have such sharp optics, whether you're hand holding them or putting them on a tripod, um, it's great. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of a, a bit on the heavy side. I think they're 48 ounces or something. And yeah, it's really cool to, to observe the night sky with them. But I think the 12 by 36s are about my favorite. I've thought about those quite a bit. I've used the 10 by 30s on a few occasions and I really like them but they're almost the same price as the 12 by 36s. And then I find with 10 power, you're just not getting that much of a boost with the uh, image stabilization. Like a 10 X, I'm sort of at the limit of what I can hold, but I can kind of hold 10 X steady enough to, to do observing, especially in like a little 30 or 35 millimeter binocular. Um, so I really, really like those 12 by 36s that you have. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're great. Um, when I bought them, I think Canon at that time only had a few models. Uh, but since then they've added some different ranges and uh, they have a 10 by 42 and uh, a 12 by 32 and a 14 by 32 and all in stabilized and another 10 by 32. So, so the, I've used the 10 by 42 and it's neat, but strange. And like, so kind of the strange thing about that 10 by 42 is that binocular works only like about a 35 or 34 millimeter binocular or something. So you're really not going to get that punch um, as much as, as you're going to get with the 12 by 36. So they're going to, 
maybe not even punches as heavy as those. You're not going to see maybe quite as much. And then the, the only advantage in my mind that you're getting with the 10 by 42 is the field of view is six and a half degrees. So you get about another degree or so over what you have. Um, but it's much heavier. The 10 by 42 is marginally lighter than the uh, 15 by 50. I think it's say like 45 or 42 ounces versus 48. And I've used it and like, you know, kind of with your eyes closed, I'm not really sure that you could tell there's that much of a difference uh, in the weight. And again, like I find with a 10 power binocular, I can kind of hold a 10 power binocular pretty steady. Um, so I'm not really getting that much of an advantage with it. Whereas the, uh, the 12 by 36 is, is really nice. And the other thing that's sort of strange about the image stabilization is I always feel like the field is a little wider anyway, because it's something to do with the way the image stabilization goes. Cause it kind of, it floats a little. So it kind of almost like, like pans outside of like your target. So it's an amazing, amazing technology. So you kind of feel like maybe if you had a five degree binocular, um, if you've got the image stabilizing on, you're, you're getting almost like a five and a half degree feel is what it feels like. Like it just feels like a... Yeah, and I, I, agreed. And I think some of that is just the comfort of it, right? Because yeah. the image stabilization, you're just able to absorb that field of view a lot better too. Yeah. Well, actually like last night, so I went on, I was like, well, maybe I should look at those new ones because I remember they, they came out and they were pretty expensive. And then I remember the price dropped about a year ago. And then now, of course, now that I'm actually thinking about it, the price is uh, back up again. <laughs> so, because they they had come out, they were very expensive. And then these new ones had dropped even below. Like I think the the twelve by thirty six was going for a hundred or hundred fifty dollars less than the ones that you bought. So I was like, well, maybe I'll get those because I really like the twelve power. Um, but the prices are back up uh, too high for me. And then uh, the other thing was I read that the eye relief and the eye cups aren't as good as on the the original series uh which is unfortunate because and you know no offense but and i think yours are better than the others but the the eye cups on the original series that was kind of a weak spot with them in my opinion like it's a little bit difficult for me to see the whole field like you really need to mess around with the uh the interpupillary distance and that kind of thing so uh, i was kind of disappointed to hear that they'd kind of taking a step in, in the wrong direction. So I think cause yours are, are rubber, but did you replace your, did you replace your eye cups on those? I know you've done some modifications to them. No, no, I never replaced the eye cups. It's the original ones on there. I just keep them folded down all yeah, the time okay. uh, yeah. because you and I both wear glasses and uh, you know, you have to fold them down for glass wearers, but I have the gen two. So there's three gens of the 12, 30, 12 by 36 is okay. And like, so my stabilization button, I have to, keep it pressed to uh, have the stabilization working. The Gen 3s, you just tap the button once and that turns on the stabilization, but they added like $300 onto the price. <laughs> so oh, it's wow. kind of crazy. So if you can find a 12 by 36 Gen 2, um, and there's not a lot of them around, you'd have to do some searching, but you can find them for you know the original price, which in my mind is is fair, and um, you know you're getting a great binocular then. Hmm. Yeah, those those are nice. Yeah, those are nice for sure. Uh, cool. How about the binoculars we made? Those are kind of fun to play with, hey? Oh yeah, those are those are amazing. Um, so mine are a little loose right now. I gotta I gotta, I'm just gonna put like a like a rim of tape on it or something like electrical tape. But so these were. These are 3D printed binoculars and uh, they don't really, they're not like a full set of binoculars. They actually look more akin to opera glasses, I think. Like, you know what I mean by opera glasses? Yeah, yeah. Like they're small. There's not a lot of, you know, focus Fog. buttons and things. And <laughs> it's just a real basic binocular. Yeah. There's no focus on them, if I recall. No. Mine, mine are in the car, I think. Um and so what had happened was uh, like, these were uh, things that were kind of going around on the internet, like on all the astronomy forums, people were, were kind of making these up or whatever. And there seemed to be kind of some futzy ways to make them and some were better than others. And then um, Randall Rosen, Rosenfeld, uh, who's, who's our national astronomy historian, uh, he and I are pretty good friends and he sent me those blueprints that were very precise, like way better. And he had, made a set and then he had modified the blueprints he's a very exacting person and so i knew it was gonna work and that we could get all the parts and whatever in canada which is always uh 
a little bit of a challenge when it comes to some of these these sort of rare uh, parts and pieces when you're trying to do something custom. And then I sent that off to you and you were able to get in touch with your brother or somebody and they were able to do the 3D printing and you ordered the, uh, what were they? They were Nikon Tele reducers there, there, or extenders? Or? They were an extender, a Nikon Tele extender for some older cool picks Nikon camera. It was a two times extender. Um, I don't remember which camera it was for, but these extenders, I think were sort of obsolete. Like I don't believe they worked with some of the more modern Nikons. So I, I think we, I think we bought four of those lenses for like $80 each or something like that, or maybe even less than that. I don't remember. It wasn't, yeah, I don't think expensive. it was, I think it was maybe $80 a set. Cause I that think could I, be, uh, I think I gave you 80 bucks and bought you a beer and uh, <laughs> you undercharged me, but, uh, but yeah, no. And they were, they were awesome. Um, and then for the eye cups, um, you know, they don't come with eye cups, of course. Uh, I came home and I had like a pair of really cheap eight by 25s from Celestron. And I just looked at those and I went, I wonder if those will fit. And I remember that I popped them off and I, you saw them the next time you're like, they look stock. Like it looks like yeah. a stock binocular, right? But uh Anyway, then I tried to see if I could find a set of those to to get uh, get a set for you, but uh, they stopped making them. I think they were just too cheap. So. Oh yeah, yeah. But yeah, those binoculars work great. Like the field of view is outstanding. Like the, the probably the best analogy is to say they give you bionic vision because yeah. at only two times magnification, there's not there's not a huge difference when you put them up to your eye, but you get you know enough of a boost that. Um, you know, the night sky is even more dazzling with the amount of stars you see, but it's such a wide field of view and it's so sharp all the way to the edge. It just is absolutely incredible how good those are. Yeah. And there are, um, you can buy these from, I think Vixen makes them. There's, there's a Russian company that had made them and, and uh, another company uh, has, has made them with them from, from China, which is probably where, where some of the other ones are sourced anyway, which is fine. Um, and they're often called like the wide bino um, two or two point something by 28 or whatever, um, or, or 49 or 50 with a 28 degree field view. But with many of those, I've heard that you can't use your glasses. And that was always what kind of held me back from buying a pair. But with the ones that we made, wearing glasses with them, at least to my eye, is no problem at all. They work yeah. perfectly fine with glasses. And um, we get about a 25 and a half degree, really sharp field of view. So maybe the other ones do have a 28 degree field of view, but you know, uh, if you can't see it and it's, and it's very difficult to use with, uh, with glasses on, then that's a bit of a showstopper in my opinion. But with these, I can get uh, pretty much like almost like I get about 95% of that field and it's really sharp. Those are really, really sharp optics. eh? Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm the same with the eye relief, like with my glasses, they're fine. Um, and you know, I, again, a little more context is just how, how good they are and how fun they are to observe. I remember one night we were down in grasslands, which is about a three hour drive from our homes. And we packed up our telescopes and our eyepieces. And I remember, remember, I think at least two nights where we never even took our telescopes out. Mm. We just use these little two by 42s or whatever they are. <laughs> and we were so impressed and, and it's just such a fun thing to pan the Milky Way with. Oh, they're incredible. Yeah. Yeah. No, they're, those are really neat. Those are really neat for sure. So, so yeah, well, hopefully we get some, uh, some good weather here, uh, Shane. We can actually get out and do, uh, do some observing shortly. Yeah, I'm uh, on vacation all this week, not going anywhere. My wife and I like to plant the garden and do some yard work, you know, just as summer is kicking off. But I also like to get out and do some observing. So the forecast right now is not looking too stunning. But yeah, fingers crossed for at least one good night to uh, get out. Yeah, hopefully. So, all right. Well, I think we'll, uh, we'll end it there. And uh, thank everybody for listening. And uh, We'll come back with uh, episode 15 here, like you and I, in about five minutes' time and uh, record one on the terrestrial planets. How does that sound? Sounds wonderful. All right. See you, everybody.